Welcome to the online services of the Pensacola Baptist Temple. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. If you would, find your Bible and go to Amos chapter number 3. Amos chapter number 3. As we continue our series preaching through the practical prophetical books of the Bible. And uh, we're going to be looking at something in Amos chapter number 1. But Amos chapter number 3 is really where I want you uh, to glean some things from as an opening text. Amos chapter number 3 verse number 1. The Bible says this. Hear this word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel. Against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you from all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Tonight I would like to preach a sermon entitled, God's Refining Justice. God's Refining Justice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, and we thank you for loving us, and Father, allowing us to have a copy of your word written in our own language. And Father, how that we can glean truths from things that were not necessarily written to us, but they were written for us. I pray, God, as we go through these uh, prophetical books, Lord, that you would teach us some things and help us, Lord, to, to glean some things and make decisions, God, that only eternity will be able to tell uh, how you've worked in our hearts in these last few days. We love you, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity to preach and pray, God, you would bless your church in the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amos is the perfect book to complement the book of Hosea. Uh, and a couple weeks ago, I preached on Hosea and talked about God's relentless pursuit of his people. And uh, today I want to speak on the subject of God's refining justice. You see, Hosea teaches us that a sinner never goes unloved, but Amos teaches us that sin never goes unpunished. Uh, as you think about this and you think about God's refining justice, I want to bring your attention to a way that they refine gold. Refining uh, gold can be done in multiple ways, but one of the ways that it can be done is with the flame. Refining with a flame is one of the oldest methods that are used to refine metals. I mentioned in, even in the Bible, refining by fire is the preferable method for larger quantities of gold. In ancient times, this form of refining involved a craftsman sitting next to a hot fire with molten gold in a crucible and being stirred and skimmed to remove any impurities or dross that rose to the top. When the flames reach temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius, you can imagine how dangerous the job would be. And so they've tried to come up with other ways that they could refine gold, and they use chemicals and other things like that. But the most popular way back in the ancient times was the flame method. And so we look here as God is going to begin refining the nations. And we're going to start in just a moment looking at the different nations that he's going to try to refine and try to bring out some bad things and show them that there are some things that he wants changed. He's also going to deal with Israel and ultimately he deals with every one of his people, even you and I, in much the same way because he is God. He doesn't change. And so we see here that uh, Amos is going to dive in in chapter number one dealing with God's judgment on the nations. God's judgment on the nations. Amos, unlike any other prophet in the Bible, we find him calling the sins out of Israel's neighbors and enemies first. Typically, when a prophet opens up and he declares sin of a nation, he will start with Israel or start with Judah, and he will go on from there to the enemies of Israel. But for whatever reason, Amos starts with the enemies. I'd like to draw your attention to this, this little nugget. What, I wonder how big of a crowd we could get in our churches if we started to proclaim all of the sins of Asia. I mean, we got in here and we started talking about all the sins of the Asian countries and, and how they were wicked and how they were idolatrous and how they, they were given over to immorality. And we started listing all those sins. I, I think we could probably get a pretty big crowd in here. And people would, would come to listen to that. And, and maybe we stop, wouldn't stop there. We'd go on to the, to the Arab countries and start listing the sins of the Arab countries. And, or maybe even any country all across the world. But when we got to the fact of America's sin and America's problem and America's fault, my friend, you and I would hear crickets. 
You and I would not see people fill the house of God like we would if we were pronouncing the sin of every, every other nation. And Amos, much like this, decided on this method of proclaiming judgment on the other nations, began with the neighboring countries of Israel, the enemies of Israel, and began to declare unto others what their sentence was going to be from God Almighty. We see in verse number 2 of chapter number 1, uh, Amos here, he says this, and he, and he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. Now, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to try to present to you why it says that, but in the first verse, you'll see at the latter part of the verse, it talks about two years before the earthquake. God actually sent a great earthquake through the Middle East that shook many different nations. And there are, there are evidence, the archaeologists have found that there was a major earthquake that hit about this time. And I've got articles on that, and so if you're listening to this and, and interested on reading some more about the earthquake, I, I'd love to send you a copy of that. So just get in touch with us. But it says in verse number three, thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away from the punishment thereof because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avon and him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden and the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto Kir, saith the Lord. And so we see here that he begins to lay out these judgments on these nations and he starts with Damascus. It's an interesting way how he brings it up. He says, not for three, but for four and then he gives us the sin. You would often look at that and to the you know, just common Bible scholar, just somebody that's just reading the Bible, we would look at that and we go, well, they must just be only guilty of three or four sins. But the truth of the matter is this was a poetical way for saying, hey, the, ra the amount of sin and iniquity, the cup of iniquity is just full. And there's iniquity on every hand. There's iniquity on every side. This is just what I'm calling you out on. And so he calls Damascus out on their cruelty. Notice if you would, in verse number three, it says that they have threshed Gilead with instruments of iron. Most Bible scholars tend to think that they actually took instruments of iron, iron plows, and just plowed over people, ripping their flesh apart and tearing them up. And so he calls Damascus out for their cruelty on the people of Gilead. My friend, the Proverbs 11, verse number 17 says this, A merciful man doeth good unto his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. And my friend, if you are, would be honest with yourself, we have become a very cruel nation in the way we deal with, with other, other, other people. And I know that some things is not, is not politically correct to talk about online, but some of the things that we do, even in war, is very, very cruel. Look at, if you would, verse number uh, six. The Bible says this, for thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, or Gaza, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive, the whole captivity, to deliver them up to Edom. And I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof, and I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and him that holdeth a scepter from Ashkelon, and I will turn mine hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord. So we see not only did he pronounce judgment on Damascus, but now he is moving over to the city of Gaza, where they took the slavery of men and women and even children. They, they put people in bonds that they were taking possession of a city. They would just put them in bonds and make them work and make them serve. So he pronounces judgment on them because of slavery of men, women, and children. Notice with me of, in verse number 9 and 10, the judgment of Tyrus. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and remembered not the brother, brotherly covenant. But I will send fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. 
This is nothing short of human trafficking, where they were actually selling people. They actually had the possession of somebody. They took possession of someone and they sold them to another nation. Not one person, not two people, but the whole nation they sold to the Edomites. Continue reading, if you would, in verse number 11. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. <laughs> no pity on others. No pity on others. No pity on the family. No pity on the neighbor. Do you see, as we're unfolding the sins of these enemy countries, we, we start to get a picture of what Israel had to look at uh, as far as who was coming against them. This past Sunday night, we spoke a little bit about Jonah, and we spoke a little bit about how they treated their enemy, the Assyrians treated their enemies. But you know what we see here? That there are so many other countries treating their enemies not only the same, but in some cases maybe even worse. In verse number 13, we continue reading, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Amron, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof with shouting in the day of battle, with the tempest in the day of, a whir of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into captivity, and he and his princes together, saith the Lord. Am Ammon was guilty of killing pregnant women and ripping their bodies apart. Notice, if you would, chapter number 2, verses number 1, and th 1 through 3. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they had because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. But I will send the fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kiroth, and Moab shall die with the tumult, with shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet. And I will cut off the judge from the midst thereof, and will slay all the princes thereof with him, saith the Lord. They burned the body of the king of Edom. Nothing less than what we would make, maybe consider a, a type of a cremation, except they just did it out of spite, not out of love for their loved one. And so they did this, and, and they, they were cruel. They had left off every brotherly kindness, every, every type of charity, and they had, be, they had given themselves over to cruel instruments and cruel ways and, and wicked devices. And you look at these nations and you start to formulate a picture of what they were and you say, well, good for the Lord. He ought to judge that nation. He ought to condemn them. He ought to send a fire. He ought to send a, a plague. He ought to destroy them. He ought to take them into captivity. Well, my friend, it's for many of the same sins that our great nation, the America, the United States of America will be judged. It's time for, it's time for us as, as Christians to stand up and plead for God's mercy for our country. You and I, we can say, God bless America all we want, but if we don't turn to Him as a whole, if we don't turn to Him as an individual, we don't turn to Him as a church, if we don't turn to Him as a nation, God's judgment will fall on our nation just as it has all the other nations we just listed. The Bible still says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and not only is God not our Lord, He is no longer our God. And we're thrusting Him out of every institution that He once was prominent in. Our, courts, our court systems, our schoolhouses, our colleges and universities. And many times now the contemporary church movement is pushing Him as far out of their church as they possibly can. Friend, it's time for you and I to stand up and say no more. You and I need to find an altar wherever we're at, somewhere, and cry out to God for His mercy upon our country. The Bible still says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. 
Pray for mercy during time of judgment on our nation. Habakkuk chapter number 3, verse number 2 still says, In wrath, remember mercy. So we may not be able to stay the hand of God totally. And we may not be able to put it off past our lifetime. It may be even right now that God's judgment will fall upon America. But we can still pray for God to remember mercy because there still is a remnant of people who love Jesus Christ, who are serving God with their whole heart. And it's for that remnant that God could still have mercy on America. Not only did he have pronounced judgment on nations, but he also pronounced judgment on God's instrument, on his instrument. Look down at verse number four, if you would, of chapter number two. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept the commandments and their lies caused them to err after the which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Most of you are aware that after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two. The northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom made up ten tribes, which was called Israel. The southern kingdom of the other two tribes, often called Judah in the scriptures. Throughout the existence of Israel, God used them as instruments to proclaim who he was to the world. I believe that most Bible scholars would agree with that statement that God, out of all the nations of the world, reached down and picked Israel to be the apple of his eye to proclaim who he was to the nations beyond. As we look here, we find that Throughout the existence of Israel, God used them as an instrument. It wasn't until 70 A.D. when the temple was burned that God officially set them aside for a season as his official uh, instrument to show forth who and what he was until the tribulation. And it's during this time that God is using churches, much like this church, the Pensacola Baptist Temple, to show the world, to show the regions beyond, to show everyone around, to show the sinner who God is. So we see that he has judgment on his instrument. Notice, if you would, Judah's judgment. They despise the law. We just read it a moment ago. Now, as we look through the scripture, we honestly don't, don't see, we don't ever see any of the Israelites in particular, saying, I hate God's word. I hate Moses' law. I hate the commandments given. I hate the ceremonial law. I hate everything about the Old Testament. We don't find that. But we do find the actions of people that are speaking louder than their words, and we see that they actually did despise the law of God. You see, keeping the law had become a nuisance to them. Always praying, always watching, washing, always sacrificing, always having to go to the temple, always having to do this and always having to do that, always giving. Well, you know, to me, that sounds a little bit like some Christians I know. It sounds a lot like some Christians I know. Preaching's too long. The singing's too loud. The giving's too offering, often. The church is too regular. My friend, we need to wake up and realize that God has not made us to do anything. He allows us to be a part of what he's doing. We don't have to listen to preaching. We get to listen to preaching. We don't have to sing. We get to sing. We don't have to give. We get to give. We are so blessed and we don't even know it. And much like Judah, you and I can fall into the trap of despising the law of God, despising his expectations for us, despising what it is that he wants us to do, despising what it is he doesn't want us to do. And I think about this as we we look in the Old Testament, we look at the story of Adam and Eve. And as Satan came to Eve that day in the Garden of Eden, he didn't have to get her to not like or be discontent With all that God had given her, he had to just get her eyes on the one thing that God did not allow her to have. 
And we can look through Judah's history and we can see that God had blessed them and God had used them and God had magnified them in the eyes of the whole world. So much so that when you open a newspaper today or you look at Facebook or you listen to the news, you hear about Israel still today. Because God has blessed them and because God has used them. There's been no other nation on planet earth that has been given so much than the nation of Israel. But yet it's that same nation that turns and despises what God is doing in their midst. I want you to think about this. Judah despised the law so much that if you were to fast forward 750 years from the time of Amos, you'll come to the time of Christ. And when they saw what the law was embodied, when they saw what the law looked like in real life, when they saw what the law was with skin on, when they saw Jesus Christ, you tell me what they did when they saw him. They didn't flock to him to love him, to embrace him, to take them as their king, to take them as their Lord, to take them as their savior. No, they crucified him. And the reason they crucified him was because of selfish jealousy, realizing that what he had is not what they had. They had empty, vain religion, and he had a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And you cannot have religion, true, undefiled religion, without a relationship with, God, with Jesus Christ and in God the Father. And as they saw it, they didn't like what they had to see, and so they crucified him with, with wicked hands, the book of Acts tells us. And my friend, let's not put too, uh, too harsh of judgment on the Israelites because had it been you and I, we would have done probably the same thing. Not only did he pronounce judgment on Judah, but we also find that he pronounced judgment on Israel. Let's continue reading down there. Verse number 6 of chapter 2, For thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel... And for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. They pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And the man and his father will go into the same maid to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. And they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their little G O. D. Israel's judgment or reason for judgment is a little bit more difficult to explain in just the one or two words like we did with the rest of them. But essentially what happened was like the other pagan nations, Israel had so digressed from what she was in her early years under Solomon, they put little to no value in the life of a person. The story of Queen Sheba, after being dazzled by Solomon in all of his glory, the queen magnified the God of Israel in 1 Kings chapter number 10. For a brief moment in his history, Israel was exactly what God had wanted her to be, a light to the nations. The situation was a result of a godly king who desired to rule with understanding heart and adhere to the law of God. And since that time, since the time of Solomon, they had so digressed to the point where now they sold a righteous man for silver. Now, we obviously understand that there are serious prophetic implications from this. We understand that Christ was sold for silver. We, we get that. We see the prophetical uh, outlook on this. But we also see the immediate conditions. And we find here that if it meant a little silver in the pocket of the Israelite then they would cheat and they would lie and they would frame and they would arrest and they would shun a completely righteous man. If, if it meant a pair of new shoes on their feet, they would lie, they would frame, they would arrest, they would shun a poor person. I Meaning they didn't have compassion on the life of any man, whether poor or righteous. Right now in our very own country, we have governors bribing people to tattletale on people who go to church. We have states that are mandating no worship services. We have other states that are doing all kind of other crazy atrocities. And although Amos was written in about 740 BC, we can see 2020 written all over it. 
because our country is in the same shape. Our churches are in the same shape. I mean, you go into one of the, one of the main churches here in America that, that are running the thousands. They, they don't put the value on a life. As a matter of fact, they are sending them to eternal hell because they're not telling them the truth. Because they want a little bit more money for their pocketbook. They're, they're not putting the value on the life. They're not promoting righteous living. They're promoting lewd living. Number three, God's judgment on the nations, God's judgment on his instrument, but also number three, God's reason for judgment. If you and I aren't careful, we tend to put God in a box or in a, in a bowl and try to press him down to make him fit our mold. For instance, when God judges, we tend to think like some parents do. They discipline their children out of embarrassment or anger. They discipline their children out of frustration. But our Heavenly Father is not that way. Because when He disciplines us and when He refines us and when He purifies us, He's doing it for our best interest in mind. He's trying to take us on a journey. He's trying to bring us closer to himself. He's trying to conform us into the image of his son. And my question to you tonight is, will you let him? So we ask ourselves the question, why does God judge the way he does? Why does he do it? Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him, him but be times. My friend, he loves you. As we looked in the very beginning in our text in Amos chapter 3 and verse number 3, we find he says, Can two walk together lest they be agreed? See, God has a desire for you, and he has a desire to walk with you. He has a desire to fellowship with you. He has a desire to be with you. But unless you agree with him, he can't walk with you. You say, well, somebody's got to change. And you're absolutely right. But my friend, we are talking about a perfect, holy, upright, righteous God who the Bible says he doesn't have to change. As a matter of fact, he can't change and he will not change and he does not change. And therefore, if someone's going to change, it's got to be you. So why does he, why does he judge? Number one. He's got too much invested to give up. If you would, let your eyes fall to verse number 9 of chapter 2. It says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up your sons for prophets, and of your young men for Nazarites, is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? You say, man, why does God judge? If God really loved me, why would he judge me? Because he, he's got too much invested to give up. He had looked across the nations, 200 and some odd nations, and he had found this nation of Israel. Just a little nation among many nations. And he picked them up and he made them a great nation. He gave them this land that flows with milk and honey and promised it to him. But because of sin, they got caught in captivity in Egypt. Idolatry set in and it took a deliverer named Moses to take them out. They finally got out and he led them around the wilderness for 40 years promising, hey, there's coming a day where I'm going to give you a promised land. There's coming a day when I'm going to fight for you. And when that day came, he did fight for them. As it says here in the scriptures, he took down the giants. He took down their chariots. He took down their iron. He took down everything that was stood in their way from being a profitable nation. He took that away and he fought for them. He says, I chose your sons. He said, I didn't go to the Gentile nations and look for people to serve me. I chose people that came from you. See, he's got too much invested in me for me, just to turn my back on him. But my friend, he's got too much invested in me for him to turn his back on me. 
I think about Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that He paid for me when He came down from heaven, down to earth, and lived a perfect life for 33 and a half years, a sinless life. Never once was He uh, ever given over to sin, not in thought or in deed. And He walked that perfect life so that I could know forgiveness of sin, so that my sin debt could be paid, and so that I could walk together with Him in agreement. He's got too much invested in, in just to give up. Number two, he's too holy to let it slide. Look down at verse number 12, if you would. But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, hey, there were some people who were devoted to me. They were Nazarites. They took a vow. They're not going to cut their hair, not going to eat wine, not going to touch anything dead, much like Samson. And you know what you did to them? You went to them and you put wine under their nose and, and in their eyes and you tempted them with it and forced them to drink the wine. Forced them to deny the covenant that they have had with me. The vow that they had promised me, you made them break it. If that wasn't bad enough, when I gave you prophets to tell you you were wrong, you told them to shut up. You told them that you didn't want to hear what they had to say. You told them that you would just go listen to someone else who tickled their ears a little bit. And my friend, God is too holy to let it slide. And he's in heaven right now and he is going to bring judgment. Yes, because he's got too much invested to give up, but also because he's too holy to let it slide. And last of all, he's too caring to let it go. Look down at verse number 1 of chapter 3. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore will I punish you from all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be degree, agreed? He says this, he says, You're mine and I chose you. Let's reason together. Let's talk about this. Let's come to an agreement. Now, I, I can't change because I'm God, but, but you can change. And if you'll just change, we can walk together as friend walketh with friend, as, as lover walketh with lover. We, we can walk together and we can be agreed hand in hand. We can do what we need to accomplish. And we know the rest of the story. Israel goes into captivity because they wouldn't do it. In closing, I want to ask you some questions. What else could God have done to prove His love, His care for you? What else could He have done? My friend, He's saved you. He's given you access to Him through prayer. He has blessed you. He's given you the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. He's prepared a home in heaven for you. He's given you 66 books within one book called the Bible, which is holy, perfect, and errant, without spot, and it's in our own English language. He's blessed you with a church. He's blessed you with a pastor. He's blessed you with, uh, with a, a good country for the most part. He, he's blessed you. He's taken care of you. He's called you. He's used you. And now he's asking you right there, right where you're at. He's asking you, will you get right? Will you turn from your sin and will you walk with me? Will you turn so that we can walk together? Now, if you and I, as Americans, we're guilty by association. Our country is full of sin. It's full of wickedness. Idolatry, hatred, variance, emulations, strife, bitterness, Wrath, malice, you name it, it's full of it. And my friend, unless you and I fall on our knees and cry out to Almighty God for His mercy and forgiveness, our country has no hope. You say, well, my country might be a sinner, but I'm not a sinner. Oh, my friend, I don't think I would go there for 1 John. Chapter 1, verse number 8 says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you need some clues as to what your sins are, just ask your children or your spouse. They'll give you a good idea. See, here's the truth. God does not need us to proclaim his message. I know that may come as a shock to most of you, but that's true. 
The Bible says if we were to hold our peace, the rocks and the hills would cry out. And, and God could use anything. He could use the stars in heaven to start singing the gospel. Uh, he could use the trees to wave in the breeze and, and come up with this melodious gospel presentation. He's already given us creation. He's already given us the butterfly to prove his resurrection. He's already given us all these things. And he could proclaim his message without me and without you. But here's the truth. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. How much more does God have to do to prove to you that, hey, you may be going through the refiner's fire and I may be judging you and I may be, I may be uh, refining you, but listen to me. If you will just go through the process, if you will just turn, I will use you and I can do great things with you. Remember, you and God are always a majority. You know, something about being put in the fire is, is it's not always fun. I mean, you think about the heat in excess of 2,000 degrees, you, you could only imagine what that would feel like even if you just stuck your hand in. But to be immersed in that fire must, must be very difficult. But see, the fires of life come in, into our life not to destroy us or to consume us, but to refine us. Job understood that. In Job chapter number 23, in verse number 10, he says this, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. And see, even though you're going through this refiner's fire, hey, don't turn away from him. Turn to him. Understand that everything he's doing in your life is in an effort to bring you closer to himself and to make you fit for his use. In conclusion, I'd like to say this. Amos was just a shepherd that God called and said, I want you to be a prophet, a preacher. You know what Amos said? He said, okay. Amos' message to the nation of Israel, to Judah, and those other nations we just listed wasn't a pleasant message. It wasn't a message that you and I would want to hear every week in and week out. But the truth is still the same. Yes, God is love, and He is all love but he's also just and he will refine you when you need to be refined. He's going to refine our nation. He's already in the process of refining our nation. We're already going through some of the judgment. Later in the book of Amos, I believe it's in chapter number 9, he says, hey, there's going to be a famine in the land, not for food or water, but for the hearing of the precious word of God. And people are going to run to and fro and try to find the word of God and they're not going to be able to find it. And there are churches on every street corner almost in America, it seems like. But the truth isn't in them. And the Word of God isn't in them. And the power of God certainly isn't in them. My friend, turn to Him to avoid the judgment. When you go through the refiner's fire, face it and come out better for it, not bitter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. And I pray, God, that you would bless this recording. I pray that those who listen, Father, will be moved uh, to make a decision for you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for listening today. You have a great day. God bless you. Till next time.